Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us for Story Hour in the Library. We'd like to thank Tony for joining us as our author, featured author this month. And we'd like to invite you back next month on March 10th for Story Hour in the Library with Scott Saul. If you'd like to find out more about Story Hour in the Library, you can visit us at storyhour.berkeley.edu. It has our full season lineup. And you can also follow us on Facebook at Story Hour, at Story Hour in the Library. Um, if you'd also like to find out via email, you can join our mailing list. It's at the front desk. You can find out updates about Story Hour as well as general updates about the library. At this time, I'd like to ask you to silence your cell phones. And if you have to get up, please do so quietly. And I'd like to invite Vikram up to do the introduction. I thank you for coming. It's my very great pleasure to welcome Anthony Mara to Story Hour. Tony grew up in Washington, D.C., and then came to California for his undergrad studies at the University of Southern California. He then earned an MFA at the University of Iowa, and following that was a Stegner Fellow at Stanford. He now teaches at Stanford as the Jones Lecturer in Fiction and lives in Oakland, uh, across the street from where Melanie and I are, and we first met him at a neighborhood cookout, actually. <laughs> Um, in 2013, Tony published his first novel, A Constellation of Vital Phenomena. The story is set in Chechnya amidst the landscape of suffering and violence. Among the six point of view characters are the young girl, Hava, whose father has had his fingers cut off with a bolt cutter during a torture session. Her neighbor, Ahmed, a doctor and artist who tries to save her, and Sonia, an ethnically Russian doctor, who with a single nurse is trying to keep a whole hospital running. The novel received the John Leonard Prize, which is given by the National Book Critics Circle for a first book, and also an Annis Field Wolf Book Award. In the Washington Post, Ron Charles said about the book that it was, I quote, a flash in the heavens that makes you look up and believe in miracles. Here in fresh, graceful prose is a profound story that dares to be as tender as it is ghastly a story about desperate lives in a remote land that will quickly seem impossibly close and important. I haven't been so overwhelmed by a novel in years, and at the risk of raising your expectations too high, I have to say you simply must read this book. Last year, Anthony published a collection of short stories, The Czar of Love and Techno. The first story, titled The Leopard, is set in Leningrad in 1937, the protagonist is a Soviet censor who paints people out of history. That is, he works as a correction artist who uses an airbrush to delete political undesirables out of photographs. He's a true believer in communism, someone who believes that for art to be the chisel that breaks the marble inside us, the artist must first become the hammer. But one day, his assistant places a photograph on his desk in which a ballerina floats above the Marinsky stage. He must now erase the ballerina. But the hammer of the state finally comes down on the correction artist, but we will see the ballerina again and her descendants as the nine stories of the book move through the 20th century, creating an indelible portrait of the suffering and resilience of ordinary Russians. Sarah Lyle wrote in the New York Times, every story is a gem in itself, the book, but the book is greater than its parts an almost unbearably moving exploration of the importance of love, the pull of family, the uses and misuses of history, and the need to reclaim the past by understanding who you really are and what really happened. And I'll borrow the first uh, reviewer's line for this one, you simply must read this book. Uh, please join me in welcoming Anthony Mara. Thank you so much for that uh, beautiful introduction and for, uh, for inviting me uh, to, to be with you here this afternoon. I'm uh, uh, thrilled to do so. Um, I am, uh, I'm going to jump right in. I, I, I usually don't have uh, enough time to read uh, a whole story since my, my stories are, are rather long, um, but I'm almost going to read a whole story uh, uh, today. Um, I'm going to start five pages in on a piece called um, The Grozny Tourist Bureau. Um, and all that you really need to know that, that has happened before uh, I, I, I begin is, is it's narrated by a man named Ruslan, 
who has been uh, tasked with creating a tourist bureau in Grozny uh, post-war. Um, he's recently given his first tour to a group of Chinese oil men, um, and he's a big fan of Jim Carrey. <laughs> Three months ago, the interior minister told me his idea. The proposition was ludicrous, but I listened with the blank-faced complacency I had perfected throughout my 23 years as a public servant. The United Nations has named Grozny the most devastated city on Earth, the minister explained between mo bites of moist trout. I wasn't sure the proper response, so I offered my lukewarm congratulations. Yes, well, always nice to receive recognition, I suppose. But as you might imagine, we have a bit of an image problem. He loomed over his desk in a high-backed executive chair, while across from him I listened from an odd, leggy stool designed to make its occupant struggle to stay upright. The minister's path had first crossed mine 15 years earlier, when he had sought my advice regarding a recently painted portrait of him and his sons and I had sought his regarding a dacha near my home village. The portrait, which still hung on the far wall, depicted the three of them in tall leather boots and baggy trousers, heroically bestriding the carcass of a slain brown bear that bore a striking resemblance to Boris Yeltsin. <laughs> Foreign investment, the minister continued. Most others don't agree with me, but I believe we need to attract attract capital unconnected to the Kremlin if we're to achieve a degree of economic autonomy. And holding the record for the world's largest ruin isn't helping. Rosneft wants to sink its fangs into our, into our oil reserves, but the Chinese will cut a better deal. Have you heard of Oleg Voronov? He's on the Rosneft board, the 14th richest man in Russia, and one of the hawks who pushed for the 1994 invasion. The acquisition of Chechen oil is among his top priorities. The minister set down his silverware and began sorting through the little bones on his plate, reconstructing the skeleton of the fish he had consumed. If we're to entice foreign investment, we need to rebrand Chechnya as the Dubai of the Caucasus. Think Switzerland without the roads. <laughs> That's where you come in, Ruslan. You're what? The director of the Museum of Regional Art? Deputy director, sir, I said. That's right, deputy director. You did fine work sending those paintings to Moscow. A real PR coup. Even the British newspapers wrote about the Trechikov exhibit. With a small nod, I accepted the compliment for what was the lowest point in my rut-ridden career. In 1999, Russian rockets demolished the museum, and with my staff, I saved what I could from the ensuing fires. Soon after, I was ordered to surrender the salvaged works to the Russians. When I saw that I'd been listed as co-curator of an exhibit of Chechen paintings at Moscow's Trechikov Gallery, I closed my lids and wondered what had happened to all the things my eyes had loved. The minister tilted his plate over the rubbish bin and the ribs slid from the spine of the fish. Nothing suggests stability and peace like a thriving tourism sector, he said. I think you'd be the perfect candidate to head the project. With respect, sir, I said. The subject of my dissertation was 19th century pastoral landscapes. I'm a scholar. This is all a bit beyond me. I'll be honest, Ruslan. For this position, we need someone with three qualifications. First, he must speak English. Second, he must know enough of our culture and history to convey that Chechnya is much more than a recovering war zone, that we possess a rich heritage unsullied by violence. Third, and most important, he must be that rare government man without links to human rights abuses on either side of the conflict. Do you meet these qualifications? I do, sir, I said, but still, I'm entirely unqualified to lead a tourism initiative. The minister frowned. He scanned the desk for a napkin before reaching over to wipe his oily fingers on my necktie. <laughs> According to your dossier, you've worked in hotels, Ruslan. When I was 16, I was a bellhop, I admitted. Well, the minister beamed. Then you clearly have experience in the hospitality industry. 
in the suitcase carrying industry, I said. So do you accept, he asked. I said nothing. And it is, as is often the case with men who possess more power than wisdom, he took my silence for affir affirmation. Congratulations, Ruslan. You're head of the Grozny Tourist Bureau. And so my future was decided, as has become custom, entirely without my consent. Over the following weeks, I designed a brochure. The central question was how to trick tourists into coming to Grozny voluntarily. For inspiration, I studied pamphlets from the tourist bureaus in other urban hellscapes, Baghdad, Pyongyang, Houston. From them, I learned to be lavishly adjectival, to treat prospective visitors as semi-literate gluttons, to impute reports of kidnapping, slavery, and terrorism to the slander of foreign provocateurs. Thrilled by my discoveries, I tucked a notebook into my shirt pocket and raced into the street. Upon seeing the empty space where an apartment block once stood, I wrote wide and unobstructed skies. I watched jubilantly as a pack of feral dogs chased a man and noted unexpected encounters with, with wildlife. The city bazaar hummed with the sales of looted industrial equipment, humanitarian aid rations, and munitions suited for every occasion, unparalleled shopping opportunities. Even before reaching the first checkpoint, I'd scribbled first-rate security. The copy was easy. The real challenge was finding images to substantiate it. After all, the siege had, re had remapped the city. Debris rerouted roads through abandoned warehouses. Once I'd found a traffic jam on a factory floor, and what was not rerouted was raised. A photograph of my present surroundings would send a, send a cannonball through my verbiage fortified illusion of a romantic paradise. And I couldn't find a suitable alternative of pre war Grozny within the destroyed archives. In the end, I forewent photographs altogether and instead used the visuals from January, April, and August of the 1984 Grozny Museum of Regional Art calendar. In the three 19th century landscapes, swallows frolic over ripening grapevines, and a shepherd minds his, flo his flock backlit by a sunset. They portray a land untouched by war or communism, and besides them, my, my descriptions of a picturesque Chechnya do not seem entirely dishonest. After depositing the troika of Chinese oilmen at the Interior Ministry, I go home. I knock on the door of the flat adjacent to mine and announce my name. Nadia appears in a headscarf and sunglasses. Turning her unscarred side toward me, she invites me in. How was the maiden voyage, she asked. It was excellent, I say. They dozed off before we, we reached the worst of the wreckage. Nadia smiles and takes measured steps towards the Primus stove. She doesn't need her white cane to reach the counter. I scan the room for impediments, yet everything is in order. Nothing on the floorboards but the Kopec coins I'd glued down in paths to the bathroom, the kitchen, the front door, so her bare feet could find their way in her early months of blindness. The kettle whistles in the kitchen. We sip tea from mismatched mugs that lift rings of dust from the tabletop. She sits to hide the left half of her face. The tourist brochures will be ready next week, I say. I'll have to send them along to our Beijing comrades if the paintings come out clearly. You use three from the Zakharov room, she asks. Yes, three Zakharovs. Her shadow nods on the wall. That gallery, the museum's largest, had been her favorite, too. The first time I ever saw her was in there, in 1987, on her first day as the museum's restoration artist. You'll have to save, save me one, she says, for when I can see it. Her last sentence hangs in the air for a long moment before I respond. I have an envelope with 5,000 rubles, I say, for your trip. I'll leave it on your nightstand. Ruslan, please, she says. St. Petersburg is a city engineered to steal money from visitors. I know. I'm in the industry. 
You don't need to take care of me, she says, with a firm but appreciative squeeze of my fingers. I keep telling you, she says, I've been saving my disability allowance. I have enough for the bus ticket, and I'm staying with the cousin of a university classmate. It's not for you, I say. It's for movies, video cassettes. Slapstick and romantic comedies have become my favorite genres in recent years. Find some that are foreign, I ask her. She's looking straight at me, or at my voice, momentarily forgetting the thing her face has become. We were together when rockets turned three floors of our city's, three floors of our city's preeminent works of art into an inferno she barely escaped. The third degree burns hardened into a chapped canvas of scar tissue wrapping the left side of her skull. That eye is gone, yet the other was partly spared. In the heat, her right, her right lids fused together, sealing her eye from the worst of the flames, and at times it can sense the flicker of light, the faintest movements. There is the possibility, an ophthalmologist has told her, that sight can be restored. However, any optical surgeon clever enough to perform such a delicate operation was also clever enough to have fled Grozny long ago to a city like St. Petersburg, where she has several appointments arranged. When her sight is restored, she will leave for Sweden. I fear for her future in a backwards country where citizens are forced to assemble their own furniture. <laughs> if it happens, the surgery, if it's successful, I say, you don't need to leave. What I need, Ruslan, is sleep. When I return to my flat, I rinse my hands in the sink and let the water run even after they're clean. Indoor plumbing was restored six months ago. Above the doorway hangs a bumper sticker of a fish with WWJCD inscribed across its body, sent by an American church along with a crate full of Bibles in response to our plea for life-saving aid. I take a dozen scorched canvases from the closet and lay them down on the floor in two rows of six. These were too damaged for the Trechikov exhibit. Not one was painted after 1879, yet they look like the surreal visions of a psychedelic addled mind. Most are charred through, some simply mounted ash, more reminiscent of, about, of Alberto Burri's slash and burn than the Imperial Academy, Academy of Arts classicism. In others, the heat melted oils have turned photorealistic portraits into dissolved dreamscapes. My closet holds one last canvas. I set it on the coffee table to examine by the light of an unshaded lamp. The seamless gradation of color, the nearly invisible brush strokes. Not even the three years I spent writing my dissertation on Pyotr Zakharov could diminish my fascination with his work. Born in 1816, on the eve of the Caucasian War that Lermontov, Tolstoy, and Pushkin would later memorialize in their, in their story cycle, he was an orphan before his fourth birthday. Yet his brilliance so exceeded his circumstances that he went on to attend the Imperial Academy in St. Petersburg, and despite ex exclusion from scholarship, employment, and patronage due to his ethnicity, he eventually became a court painter and a member of the Academy. He was a Chechen who learned to succeed by the rules of his conquerors, a man not unlike the interior minister, to be admired and pitied. A meadow, an apricot tree, a stone wall in a diagonal meander across the grasses, the pasture cresting into a hill, a boarded well, a house. It's among the least ambitious of all Zakharov's work. Here is an artist who painted portraits of czars and generals and grand duchesses and the famed depiction of Imam Shamil's surrender. And this, in my hands, portrays all the drama its title suggests empty pasture in afternoon. I grew up in the Southern Highlands, just a few kilometers from this exact pasture. Though the, the land was technically part of a state farm, nothing was ever planted, and flocks were banned from grazing because no one liked the idea of sheep relieving themselves on Zakharov's soil. During secondary school, on a class trip to the Grozny Museum of Regional Art, I finally beheld the canvas that existed with greater vibrancy in village lore than it ever could on a gallery wall. More than anything, it was that painting that led me to study art history at university, and there I met 
and married my wife. We lived with my parents in cramped quarters well into our 20s and found the privacy to speak openly only in deserted public areas, on the roof of the village schoolhouse, in the waiting room of the shuttered clinic, in Zakharov's pasture. After I received my doctorate and position at the museum, we relocated to a Grozny flat where we learned to talk in bed. The USSR fell, we had a son. With the assistance of the interior minister, I purchased the dacha in Zakharov's pasture amid the frenzied privatization of the post-Soviet pre-war years. When the first war began, I stayed in Grozny to protect the museum from the alternating advances of foreign soldiers and local insurgents. My wife and son fled to the dacha far from the conflict. In my research for the Tourist Bureau, I've learned that the First and Second Chechen Wars have rendered the Republic among the most densely mined regions in human history. The United Nations estimates that 500,000 were planted, roughly one for every two citizens. I was unaware of this statistic when I visited the dacha during the First War, taking what provisions I could from the ruined capital, a few treats for which I paid, paid dearly tea leaves for my wife, sheets of fresh drawing paper for my son. But I knew enough to warn my family never to venture into the pasture. Initially, they heeded my words. I don't know how it happened on that May day in 1996, if they were pursued, if the, if the per perilous field were a relative sanctuary, if they were afraid, if they called for help, if they called for me. I'd like to believe that it was a day so beautiful they couldn't resist the crest of the hill, the open sky, that radiance. I'd like to believe that my wife suggested a picnic, that their penultimate moment was one of whimsy, charm. I'd like to believe anything to counter the more prob probable realities at the edge of my imagination. With terror or joy, with abasement or delight, they remained my wife and child to the end. I, I must remind myself of this, because in the mystery that subsumes those final moments, they are strangers to me. I was in Grozny, at the museum, and never heard the explosion. For the two weeks Nadia is in Petersburg, my evenings stretch and stagnate. Twice I go to Nadia's flat to clean her bedroom closet, the back corners of shelves behind the toilet, the little places that even in her fastidiousness she misses. I must make myself into a crutch she cannot risk discarding. One Wednesday night, feeling unusually alert given the hour, I contemplate Zakharov's pasture. It's the least ruined of the canvases. The principal damage, aside from stains of ash and soot, being the burn hole at its center upon the hill, which I see as the aftermath not of the museum fire, but of the mine blast, the crater into which everything disappeared. A few years ago, Nadia could have restored it in a few days. It gives me an idea. I let myself back into Nadia's flat to retrieve her restoration kit. At home, I set the kit beside the Zakharov. Plastic bottles of emulsion cleaner, neutralizer, gloss varnish, conditioner, varnish remover. A tin of putty, eight meters of canvas lining. A depleted packet of cotton-tipped swabs. A dozen disposable gloves. I'd taken a year-long course in, con in conservation at, at university, but my real education came from Nadia. When, in the months after my family passed, I neglected my duties as deputy director and spent most afternoons in her office watching her work. Every evening for the next week, I snap on the disposable gloves and wash away the surface dirt with, co with cotton balls dampened in neutralizer. The emulsion cleaner smells of fermented watermelon, and I apply it with the swabs in tight circles until the tips gray and the unadulterated color of Zakharov's palate is revealed. Employing the repair putty as sealant, I patch the burn hole with a square of fresh canvas. Then I paint. The, to the totality of my attention is focused on an area the size of, of ha half a playing card. The grass, turned emerald by sunlight, must be flawless. And I spend several hours testing different blends of oils. 
As I apply them with delicate brush strokes, I realize that even in his rendering of a distant field, Zakharov is beyond imitation, and that were Nadia here to witness my final infidelity, she would never forgive me. With precise, strong lines, I draw them as silhouettes. The boy's arms are raised, his body elongated as he makes for the crest, his head thrown back in rapture. The woman hurries a step behind, animated by his anticipation. Their backs are to me. The sun rakes the grass, and ripe apricots bend the branches. No one chases them. They run from nothing. Nadia has returned, and the white tea has cooled in our cups, and still she hasn't mentioned the Petersburg eye surgeons. Good news, she says, and feels across the floor for her suitcase, then hands me two VHS cassettes. These are the ones you wanted, right? I examine the cases, Soviet comedies, sadly. Yes, these are exactly the ones, I say. I was afraid the street vendor had swindled me, she said. What did the doctors tell you, Nadia? The pause is long enough to peel a plum. She delivers her reply with a downcast frown. Reconstructive surgery is possible. I force as much gusto as I can muster into my congratulations, slapping a palm on the table while my spine wilts. What will I be if Nadia no longer needs me? This is truly good news, though. Of course it is. But her face is joyless. What's wrong, I asked. Is there a long wait for the operation? There won't be one, she says. What? Why not? Too expensive. She's facing the empty chair across the table, thinking I'm still sitting there. 115,000, she says. 115,000 rubles. A huge yet not impossible sum. Years to save for, but within the realm of possibility. Already, I'm scheming ways to defraud the interior ministry when she says dollars. My heart spirals and crash lands somewhere deep in my gut. At 33 rubles to a dollar, the figure is insurmountable. Nadia reaches for her purse and pulls out an envelope. What I owe you for the trip. Help me count it out, she says. For a moment, her instinct to trust anyone, even me, is infuri infuri infuriating. Isn't suspicion the natural condition of the blind? Haven't I w warned her, told her to be careful, cautioned that she can't rely on anyone? But by some perversion, she's become more credulous, more willing to believe that people aren't by nature hucksters and scoundrels, which is why, I suppose, my VS VHS collection is rounded out with gentlemen of fortune. It's nothing, I say. I'm paying you back, she says. If you want to be a martyr, go join them in the woods, I say. Help me count it out, she insists, her voice stern, cool, serious. I still have money left from the disability fund. I am not a charity. Of course there is no disability fund. Of course the government isn't providing her a stipend or subsidizing the flat adjacent to mine. The cash is delivered in the Interior Ministry envelope on the first of the month, comes from me, as does her rent. I'm waiting, she says. We both know that this is a farce, but I sit beside her. I play my part in the lie that pres preserves the illusion that our friendship our romance, whatever this is, is based on affection rather than dependence. I count the bills that I will return to her, and we shake hands as if our business is concluded, as if there is nothing left that we owe one another. In bed, I run my fingers through what remains of her hair, press my fingertips to her cheeks. I slide my hand down her to torso, over the bulge of her left breast, the hook of her hip bone, to, to thighs so smooth and unmarked, they're hers only in darkness. She turns away. Lying here, I nearly forget the falling rockets, the collapsing museum, the cinder blocks shifting like ice cubes in a glass, the air of a clean sky impossibly distant. The Zakharov was in my hands when I found her, her face halved, her teeth chattering. I nearly forget how I lifted her cheek to cool it with my breath, how her eyes searched for me as I held her. 
So many times I've warned her of monsters ready to prey on the vulnerable. And as she turns, I nearly forget to ask myself, what monster have I become today? In the morning, I return to my flat and find the paintings on the floor where I left them. Daylight grants the scorch and char an odd beauty, as if the fires haven't destroyed the works but revised them into expressions of a brutal present. I pick up the nearest one, a family portrait commissioned by a nobleman as a wedding present for his second son. The top third of the canvas has been incinerated, taking with it the heads of the nobleman, his wife, his first son, and the newly betrothed. And all, but all their bodies remain, dressed in soot-stained breeches and petticoats. And by their feet sits a little dog, so fat its legs barely touch the ground. The only figure in a painting intended to convey the family's immortal honor to survive intact. I hang the, the canvas on the wall from a bent nail and step back, marveling that here, for the first time in my career, I have displayed a work of modern art. After pulling the furniture into the kitchen, I hang the remaining canvases throughout the living room, finally coming to the restored Zakharov, which I consider returning to the closet, where it would exist in darkness for me alone. But my curatorial instincts went out, and I mounted beside the others. I scrawl a sign on a, sh on a cardboard shingle and nail it to the front door, Grozny Museum of Regional Art. Over the following weeks, I bring all my tours through the newly opened museum. A delegation from the Red Cross, more Chinese oilmen, a heavyweight boxing champ, a British journalist. This is what remains the canvases shout. You cannot burn ash. You cannot raise rubble. As the only museum employee, I give myself a long overdue promotion. Henceforth, I am director. The newly installed telephone rings one morning, and the gloomy interior minister greets me. We're properly fucked, he says. Nice to hear from you, sir, I reply. I'm still in my sleeping clothes, and even for a phone conversation, I feel unsuitably dressed. The Chinese are out, he said. They traded their drilling rights to Rosneft for a few dozen Russian fighter jets. I nod, grasping why Beijing didn't send its shrewdest representatives. So this means Rosneft will drill, I say. Yes, and it gets even worse, the minister heaves. I may very well be demoted to deputy minister. I was a deputy for many years, I say. It's not as bad as you think. When the world takes a dump, it lands on a deputy's forehead, the minister insists. I couldn't deny that. What does this mean for the tourist bureau, I asked. It means that you should find new employment. But first, you have one final tour, Oleg Voronov from, from Rosneft. It takes a beat for the name to register. The 14th richest man in Russia, I ask? 13th now. With respect, sir, I give tours to human rights activists and print journalists, people of no power or importance. What does a man of his stature want with me? My question precisely, Ruslan. Apparently, his wife has heard of this art museum you've cobbled together. What is it you've been up to? It's a long story, sir, I say. You know I hate long stories, the minister says. But do show him our famed Chechen hospitality, perhaps with a glass of unboiled tap water. <laughs> Let's give the 13th richest man in Russia an intestinal parasite. I'll do my best, sir. Three weeks pass, and here he is, Oleg Voronov, in the back seat of the Mercedes with his wife, the actress Galina. Sitting up front is his assistant, a bleached, blonde parcel of productivity who takes notes even when no one is speaking. Still, try as I might, I'm unable to properly hate Voronov. So far, he's been non-talkative, inattentive, uncurious. In short, a model tourist. Galina, on the other hand, recites historical trivia unfamiliar even to me. She asks thoughtful questions, treating me not as a servant or even as a tour guide, but as a scholar. I casually mention the landmines, the street children, the indiscriminate suffering, and Voronov and his wife shake their heads with sympathy. 
Nothing I say will turn them into the masks of evil I need them to be. When the, when the oligarch checks his watch, a cheap plastic piece of crap, I feel an affinity for a man who deserves its opposite. The tour concludes at my flat. As I open the door, I say, this is what remains of the Grozny Museum of Regional Art. Voronov and Galina pass the burned out frames to the pasture. Is this the one, he asks her. She nods. A Zakharov, no, he insists, he, he inquires, fingering his lapel as he turns to me. There was, an uh, there was an exhibit of his at the Trechikov, if memory serves, not long ago. Only now do I recognize clearly the animals I have invited into my home. When the museum was bombed, bombed, the fires destroyed most of the original collection, I say. We sent what was saved to the Trechikov. But not this, he asks. Not this, I say. Rather reckless, don't you think, to leave such a treasure on an apartment wall, he asks. It's a minor work, I say. Believe it or not, my wife has been looking for a Zakharov. She collects art from every region I drill, he says. Could I offer you a glass of water, I say. <laughs> you could offer me the painting. I force a laugh. He laughs too. We are laughing. Ha ha. The painting is not for sale, I say. He stops laughing. It is if I want to buy it, he corrects me. This is a museum, I say. You can't have a painting just because you want it. The director of the Trechikov wouldn't sell you the art from his walls just because you can't afford it. You are only the deputy director, and this isn't the Trechikov, he says. There's real pity in his voice as he surveys the ash flaking from the canvases, the dirty dishes stacked in the sink. And yes, now, at last, I hate him. I have a penthouse gallery in Moscow, he says, temperature and moisture controlled, first rate security. No one but Galina and I and a few guests will ever see this painting. You must realize I'm being much more than reasonable. In a less than subtle threat, he nods out the window to the street below, where three armed Goliaths skulk beside their Land Rover. What is the painting worth, he asks. It's worth, I begin, but how can I finish? What price can I assign to the last Zakharov in Chechnya, to the last image of my home? One sum comes to mind, but it terrifies me. Wouldn't that be the worst of all outcomes, to lose the Zakharov and Nadia in the same transaction? Just take it, I say. You took everything else. Take this, too. Voronov bristles. I'm not a thief. Tell me what it's worth. My gaze floats and lands upon the bumper sticker WWJCD. What would he do? Jim Carrey would be brave. No matter how difficult, Jim Carrey would do the right thing. I close my eyes. $115,000 US. One fifteen, he asks. I nod. That's what then? 3.7, 3.8 million rubles? Voronov fixes me with a venomous stare, then turns to his wife, who still hasn't glanced away from the painting. A single fleshy clap startles me like a gunshot, and I spin to see Voronov smiling once more. Let's make it an even four, he says expansively. The, the assistant unyokes herself from a mammoth purse and spills eight stacks of banded 5,000 ruble bills onto the floor. Never trust banks, Voronov said. You can have that advice for free. It's been a pleasure. He slaps my back, tells the assistant to bring the canvas and heads for the door. Then he's gone. Galina remains at the Zakharov. Even as I'm losing it, I am proud my painting can elicit such sustained attention. She smiles apologetically, touches my shoulder, and follows her husband out. Then I'm left with the assistant, whose saccharine perfume reeks of vaporized cherubs. You'll have to give us a curatorial description, the assistant says, something we can mount on a placard beside the frame. 
She passes me a notepad and I stand before my painting a long while before I begin. Notice how the shadows in the meadow mirror the clouds in the sky, in the sky I write. How the leaves of the apricot tree blow with the grass. No verisimilitude escapes such a master. The wall of white stones cuts an angle across the composition, both establishing depth and offsetting the horizon line. Channels of turned soil run along the left flank of the hill. Perhaps freshly dug graves or recently buried landmines, but no, closer inspection reveals the furrows of a newly planted herb garden. The first shoots of rosemary already peek out. Zakharov portrays all the peace and tranquility of a spring day. The, the sun shines comfortingly and hours remain before nightfall. Toward the crest of the hill, nearing the horizon, you may notice what look to be the ascending figures of a woman and a boy. Pay them no mind, for they are merely the failures of a novice restoration artist. They are no more than shadows. They are not there. Thank you. I think we have a, a couple minutes. If, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to, um, uh, to field any and all. Not all at once. Yes? Um, it's apparent that this the universe is the same one that um, the constellation is in. Are you planning at any depth? Are you planning to write, I guess, in the same universe in the future? Like, will we ever get a mention of, like, how about some time? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That's a, a terrific question about, uh, about uh, the, the, my first and second book, uh, a Constellation, and uh, the czar of, of love and techno sort of occupying the same uh, the same universes and um, and yeah actually in, in that this piece that I that I just read I I cut out a, a little link that that connects it to constellation just because uh, it seemed extraneous for, for these purposes um, and and Hava the the young girl in the uh, uh, in in that first novel makes a brief appearance towards the end of, of this book. Um, and I, I really do love uh, uh, writers who are able to construct those sort of multiverses. I think David Mitchell um, is, is an incredible example where with each book, you get the feeling that, um, that even these you know, 600 page tomes are really just chapters in this, in this sort of you know, uh, multi thousand page uh, masterpiece. Um, I actually, uh, I, I, I did that a little bit with these two, mainly because I sort of saw them as pieces of, of a whole. Um, the first book is, is set in uh, uh, the 90s and early 2000s and is set in Chechnya, and the second one is set over about 80 years of, of Russian history, and um, so they were very much in conversation. The book I'm working on now is set in um, Italy and Los Angeles in the 1940s. Um, so it, it's gonna be tricky to figure out how to, <laughs> how to thread, that, uh, thread that needle. Um, but it is, it's something I'd be open to. One of the things that I kind of regret is after I published this new book, um, uh, The Czar of Love and Techno, I realized a way that I really could have conjoined the two in, in, in a way that, um, that I'm sorry I, I, uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, uh, I didn't see as I was writing. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so yeah, who knows uh, for the rest of them though. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it's a great question. Um, uh, it began really when I was in, uh, when I was in college. I, um, I uh, went to school in uh, Los Angeles and I, um, I was obsessed with, with Russian literature um, and I decided that I was going to uh, study abroad in St. Petersburg, um, uh, Russia. And um, the, uh, the study abroad program had a uh, four semester minimum uh, a requirement of, of college uh, level Russian in order to, to go. Um, and I had zero semest semesters. Um, but I wanted to be a, uh, uh, a fiction writer. 
So I, I practiced my craft on my application. Um, and, and I ended up in, uh, in St. Petersburg in the middle of January. Um, it was about negative, you know, 20 degrees, um, uh, light for about four hours at midday, and I had all of my clothes from Los Angeles. <laughs> and I lived with a family that spoke no English, and I spoke no Russian, um, and uh, it was uh, uh, a, bit of a, a bit of a fiasco, uh, to be honest. Um, but uh, I, I, I fell in love with, with uh, Russian um, culture and its, its history, its literature, its, its arts. Um, there's there's this sense of um, of extremes uh, in 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 uh, recent Russian history um, that that make it so inviting um, for a, a novelist to sort of pin you know pin a small domestic uh, uh, story to the the tales of these of these you know blazing comets of, of geopolitical events. Um, I became interested in, in Chechnya uh, because I, I lived down the street from a military cadet academy, and I would see these uh, 16 and 17 year old cadets, just a few years younger than me, uh, marching up and down the block in military formation, wearing their uniforms and their peaked caps and all of that. And um, uh, in their daily marching, they would sometimes march past this uh, uh, this metro station, and at rush hour, you would see uh, veterans of a conflict that these young cadets might one day join come to the metro station to, to panhandle. And many of them uh, uh, had lost limbs in in the war, and they were in uh, uh, you know rather uh, a, a dire uh, condition. And uh, the sight of, of these teenagers sort of marching lockstep past these um, these destitute veterans, it just seemed like this strange moment where the past and, and future were rubbing right up against each other. And it got me thinking and wondering what it was that separated these two groups of young people besides, uh, besides a few years and a few feet of asphalt. And the answer was, of course, Chechnya. And at the time, it was a place I knew absolutely nothing about. Um, but over the subsequent uh, six, six or so years, um, I came to uh, really just become fascinated with it. And, and you know, I read everything I, everything I could, could get my hands on set there. I traveled there. Um, and I tried to find uh, a, a work of fiction available in English uh, that was set there. And uh, to my surprise, there, there were none. Um, nothing nothing uh, set in Chechnya over the last 30 or 40 years. And um, it just seemed like uh, a, real, uh, a real gap. Um, and so I came to, to write the first book and, and then this, this sort of accompanying second book um, as, a, uh, as, as a reader more than a writer. It was, it was the book that I wanted to find um, you know, on the shelves of, uh, of Morrison Library, um, but, uh, but it wasn't there yet. Please. So I read somewhere that you used to make mixtapes in high school, and you specifically referenced pop bands. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to share a partial track list if you remember? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I, I uh, uh, the uh, this 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 the second book, The Czar of, of Love and Techno, was sort of structured as as a mixtape. Um, um, and the idea was was that uh, was that I think that good short story collections sort of function like like mixtapes in that um, in that they're not collected. You don't collect stories the way you would collect loose change, but rather you you lay them out in a very deliberate manner. Um, the idea being that that the sum of a of a collection is is uh, much bigger than its uh, constituent parts. And I think that's how a good mixtape works. That that it it forms. Um, an emotional narrative um, that you're taking your uh, intended audience through, uh, and and in my case, when I was uh, uh, you know 16 and 17 years old, uh, uh, it was always somebody that I had a crush on, um, and actually. Pretty much all of the all of the the tracks I would put on were from Berkeley uh, bands. It was just sort of the Lookout Record um, catalog. Uh, so the Mr. Pretty much every track was the Mr. T experience, um, and uh, I, I played in a terrible pop punk band. Um, and uh, yeah, I still you know I, I still listen to to Dr. Frank um, quite regularly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are there any books in particular you recommend? 
Yeah, I in in terms of uh, of uh, of of some of the the, the ones that that really um, affected me, the 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 sort of the the, the classic nineteenth century ones um, were were sort of my my gateway into uh, Russian literature. Um, the one that that may have sort of had the most impact on me the last. Uh, the last few years was uh, called Life and Fate by uh, a writer named uh, Vasily Grossman. Um, and he was uh, sort of thought of as, as being the, the Tolstoy of uh, the 20th century. He, um, he was uh, a journalist and he, he worked for uh, Red Star, which was the Russian military um, uh, newspaper. And he, uh, he reported for most of the major um, battles on the Eastern Front. He ended up becoming the first journalist to write um, uh, to write about the Nazi uh, death camps, and uh, a number of his reports were introduced as testimony in the Nuremberg trials. Um, and he wrote this book, uh, Life and Fate, um, um, which is about five thousand pages long, and uh, uh, and uh, you know. Epic in every sense of, of the word, and it was um, it was deemed by by Khrushchev to be so dangerous that they disassembled his typewriter, the typewriter that he wrote it on, that <laughs> that they couldn't trust the typewriter that had had penned those words, and uh, Khrushchev said something along the lines that that uh, humanity wouldn't be ready to read this for another two centuries, uh, that that he didn't want it destroyed, it had to be preserved, but that that humanity wasn't ready for it yet. Um, and it's this sort of epic story of, uh, of, of love and war and, and politics um, uh, set, uh, sort of focused on, on uh, this, the Battle of Stalingrad, but sort of spiraling out all over um, Europe at the time. And it was one of the first instances where, um, where sort of Nazi and Stalinist uh, ideologies were, uh, were compared or, or, or were, were viewed as sort of um, uh, part of the same uh, uh, coming from the same sort of t totalitarian uh, mindset rather than being in opposition to one another. Um, but it's, it's a, a really beautiful uh, book and I would, I would highly recommend it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the the question was about sort of comedy and 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 tragedy or, or comedy and and uh, humor and 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 hero um, uh, in uh, in my work. And um, I I think that uh, that the 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 more serious a subject you're you're going to write about, the more uh, sort of dark it is, the the funnier it has to be. That um, that if it's not funny, I, I just don't think it's. Um, it's realistic, and you know, probably the the darkest um, uh, book I've ever read in my life is called "A Small Corner of Hell" by um, the the journalist uh, Anna Politkovskaya, and it's about um, uh, Chechnya uh, and, and about this this conflict. But it's studded with these these sort of acidic moments of of humor. Um, and when I was traveling through through Chechnya, um, I was amazed at how. Um, how sharp and, and sort of finely honed uh, a comedic sensibility sort of most of the people I met had. And they would be able to identify the one thing you were most afraid of and then tease you mercilessly for it. Um, and so I was afraid of being kidnapped. And so people would you know, make jokes like, you can ride shotgun on the way there, but you'll be in the trunk on the way back. <laughs> Um, and you know, it's part of, in part, of course, it's it's a defense mechanism that um, that if you're able to to laugh at something, it loses you know so much of its of its ability to to harm you. Um, that you know, we we whistle past the graveyard and we laugh at what would otherwise make us make us cry. Um, but I think it's also a, a kind of defiance um, against uh, against uh, despair and. Um, so in terms of this material, I think, I think that's why I, I really tried to, um, to sort of layer it with, um, with dark humor. But I think that, um, that, uh, that as a reader, if you're not, um, if, if I'm not laughing regularly, um, a book just sort of feels a bit, uh, a bit lifeless. You know, life is, is nothing if not, if not funny. Um, and if, and if fiction can't capture that essential, um, sort of absurd, uh, humor to, to all of our lives, um, uh, it, it seems like it doesn't capture something quite vital and, and essential about uh, existence as I know it. Last question? 
Last question. Um, yes. You've done a lot of research for both of your books, so how would you respond to the adage that writers should just write what they know? Uh, it's it's a, a, a great uh, a conundrum and, and one that I that I've struggled with this question of, of write what you uh, write what you know I mean I, I think that as adages go um, I prefer the adage write what you want uh, write what you would like to know um, that uh, that that way you at least don't run the risk of, of uh, running out of things to write about um, <laughs> if you're uh, you know if you're curious um, but I, I think I think it is you know um, I'm a uh, you know, I'm, I'm a white, very privileged American writing about a place on the other side of the world full of, of people who, uh, whose shoes I've, I've only had to walk in in my imagination. And, um, and I feel like, like there are certainly um, moral and, and aesthetic um, uh, uh, contradictions in that that I, I struggle with, um, you know, every day uh, that, that I work. And um, um, I guess my... Uh, my hope is 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 that as as a writer writing about uh, these places that are so far removed from me um, that that the fiction acts like a tunnel that that sort of drops me through the center of the earth and hopefully by extension the reader too, um, so that I can emerge on the other side next to people I never would otherwise um, uh, really have the chance to truly know. Um, and uh, and for me, it's 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 sort of risk uh, worth the uh, the risk of uh, of failure in in that regard. Um, thank you so much for uh, for coming.